Thank you, uh, Dr. Oropalo and Dr. Armstrong for being here. My name is Anima Shagarwal. I am the moderator for today. Great talks uh, taught me a little bit about CDO um, and your uses. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started with some questions that have already been submitted. Um, and really, this is primarily for Dr. Oropalo. Uh, one of the big questions is, as uh, Dr. Armstrong mentioned, he uses it for diabetic ulcers. But do you find that this CDO treatment will uh, be effective for ischemic ulcers or venous ulcers? And yes, I can comment towards that. We've used a CDO therapy in a multitude of applications, um, not necessarily for, uh, like I mentioned before, failure of hyperbaric oxygen therapy and so forth. And um, some of them have been ischemic ulcers. However, I would caution the use of it exclusively for ischemic ulcers. Obviously those patients do need to be uh, revascularized or assessed by a vascular surgeon beforehand to be optimized uh, so that CDO therapy can be a adjunctive method to, um, for its efficaciousness. I, I think you summarized it really well, Isha. I, I mean, I think, you know, if someone does not have enough um, outflow or runoff uh, to their extremity, uh, you know, this is not going to make the tissue spontaneously reanimate, um, nor is anything. I think, but I think what it is doing um, is it may be a really um, excellent adjunct, and I think the data um, are are supporting that, especially as we are seeing more and more patients that don't have, um, you know. Um, these purely neuropathic wounds, uh, many, if not most of our patients now in North America and around the world that, you know, are, have some element of ischemia. So I think this is something that we're going to be seeing more and more. Great question. And uh, can you also comment on this uh, venous ulcers? Uh, oh, Alicia, you wanted to speak to VLUs? I can talk yeah. to that too, but go ahead. Yeah. Sure. Uh, for the VLUs, um, we have used uh, uh, CDO therapy with... Um, with uh, improvement of the leg ulcers. Uh, again, you wanna caution in, in patients that are, have heavily exudative wounds because CDO therapy initially will have some exudate associated with it. So uh, you wanna just place it on accordingly when you've got the exudate under control. Uh, you can certainly use uh, CDO therapy for venous leg ulcers. Uh, and you can still uh, maintain the CDO therapy with compression, concomitant compression therapy. Okay, great. Um, there's another, there's a couple of questions here, which y'all may or may not. Um, I know we don't have uh, full coverage here yet. Um, one question is how to obtain a CDO unit for home care. Um, and I don't know if either of you have been able to do that or had any issues, but maybe you can, and I know you, Y'all are in different states, and it's a lot of that is based on where you are uh, in the in the U.S. Uh, so that's one is how to how to get one for home care. So do y'all have? Comments? Yeah, perhaps perhaps I think it, I, I saw here that uh, Cynthia Gilliam is on, and maybe she has some expertise in that. I think since she uh, um, works for you know one of the uh, the top oxygen companies, I think EO2, so maybe they can offer some some guidance there. Cynthia, are you, oh, you're not able, are you able to type any of that in or maybe you can follow up with some of the people? Um, yeah, if you can. I'm not sure they have acts. They can if they don't, uh, if they don't, no, 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 uh, no worries, but maybe yeah. we can uh, follow up on that. I, I will tell you that, um, you know, I've, oh. I've been uh, over the years now, um, this is, you know, been like 10 or 15 years in coming and, uh, uh, as we've been exploring these data and uh, they've been sort of mounting now. And, you know, um, I, I've been to Baltimore and, and CMS any number of times talking with them about a variety of different technologies and especially this now. And, you know, I think they're just, things are often slow to change, but I think there's just such a tidal wave of data uh, for this and other, you know, other various randomized control trials supporting this. I think we're probably going to see this approved at some point uh, um, uh, in, in the future uh, by, by various carriers. I, I think, you know, the data are what they are. Yeah. And, uh, and, and so it's that, that part's really promising. So real quick from the company, from two people from there. Um, so it, it is available in New York City Medicaid, a veterans, veterans Affairs System and the IHS. 
Uh, to get it for home care, it requires a prescription and they can follow up with the home health agencies after that. And their clinical staff from EO2 will help train any home health agency out there. Um, so I just wanna, I just wanna uh, quickly add, uh, Amish, um, the, uh, we do use it in, um, in New York. And uh, like you mentioned, it is available. And we have in service the home healthcare agency uh, in doing and how to apply it as well. So, but there is a lot of support from the company to obviously train uh, the home healthcare agency and, uh, and even the patients in the application of it. Yeah, and, and I think Alicia and Anamesh, I mean, I really think this is where, uh, those are great questions. I think this is really where a technology like this is gonna be helpful is, is really kind of maximizing, as we say, sort of hospital free days and kind of moving the, you know, our patients from sort of hospital hospital to home. I wanted to ask Alicia, since you've been, uh, you mentioned a couple of these patients, one of the kind of sort of serendipitous um, findings we've had um, over years actually, but uh, uh, even amongst patients in these, some of these randomized controlled trials has been a mitigation of pain. Um, I, I can't really explain it, uh, frankly, but it does appear to be really pretty consistent. Can, do you, have you had that same experience, at least anecdotally initially in your series? And can you, you wanna to speak to that? Yeah, thank you. Um, I initially mentioned it in my lecture, but it's really been uh, kind of a continuum that I've seen is that the CDO therapy does help with decreasing the pain. And again, it's all anecdotal, but still it does uh, make a significant difference, especially for those patients that are having a lot of pain associated with their wounds. Yeah, I wanted to count because I was gonna ask you about that because I've been using it for a while. I'm like, and I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon for those of you that don't know what I do. So I'm, I'm in a different wheelhouse than either of my other two panelists here, but um, I deal with more surgical wounds that may be dehissed or having problems. Uh, and they have a lot of pain. And I've tried different modalities to get some of these superficial wound um, dehiscences to heal. And I have been amazed at the pain relief that they have had. And I'm still scratching my head as to why. And as you know, trying to study pain relief is always very subjective, but that has been the one consistent thing throughout all our patients is, is the pain relief. So it's, it's good to see that everybody else has that same kind of uh, clinical experience with these patients. So um, moving on real quick, there is uh, another question. Oh, just uh, for Kate or Cindy, just in terms of what is the cost for the unit? Uh, people are interested about that. Um, I'm sure that varies from uh, where you are in the country and uh, insurances, but um, I'll, I'll wait for them. But um, I hopefully we can get you an answer here for that. They are working with CMS to uh, get approval, hopefully all across the country. And Anamish, I heard from uh, Canada, apparently we have Canadians on here too. There's no Zoom sort of moratorium at the border, FYI there, Agarwal. <laughs> uh, uh, but I heard here from Phil Abood, who said, who I uh, haven't heard from in a long time. He had indicates that there is home care, uh, I, th I guess uh, Health Canada or, uh, must cover it um, uh, north of the border as well for home care. <laughs> Right. Yeah, well, in New York, we, we have it, again, for- And Medicare. you border Canada. That may we be yeah, based on my true. last uh, check of the map. <laughs> and then- uh, think, At least before the pandemic. Yeah, so someone else also chimed in from New York that it is approved after insurance verification on most, if not all, managed Medicaid programs in New York State. So that's, uh, that's good to, to know. So thank you, Dr. Ioria, for that. Um, for those of you that need an email to ask some other questions, uh, you can contact the, one of the reps at info at eo2.com if you have any other questions directly related to the logistics of getting it or um, payments, et cetera, and they can, they can help you directly with that. Um, so one question I had for uh, both of you, it sounds like both of you have been using it now for, for quite a while. So how has... CDO therapy, you know, we all have various modalities to help with healing these wounds. As you showed a nice slide of all these, you know, six different types of uh, adjunct therapies to use for treating. So how has CDO 
changed it? Has it jumped to the top of your list? Uh, you know, if each of you can kind of talk to that. It's like, it's become your go-to now, or, you know, where are we with that? Hey, Alicia. So I don't think it's changed other standard of care, you know, like for instance, compression therapy. I feel like it's almost an adjunctive method to when you've got that good granulation tissue uh, and you've got a decreased amount of exudate, that's when you can really use the CDO therapy. Uh, so it's an application to help expedite the wound healing. However, if, if a patient has an infection or there's other issues that need to be addressed, uh, for instance, what we talked about with the revascularization, you have to address those issues. Uh, so I think that uh, when you're looking for a, an application of something to, and when you're at that phase, like a proliferative phase, uh, and the patient's been optimized, uh, I think that's a really great time to use CDO therapy in a wide variety of applications. And before I have you answer, David, uh, just something that uh, Dr. Orparl said, because one of the questions is, can you explain how does it work in patients who have venous ulcers and two layer compression bandages in place? Are you gonna use it in that patient or no? Or how do you manage that patient? Yeah, you certainly can. Uh, and like I said, if it's not uh, heavily exudative, you can place it right on top and you can even place other uh, applications of, for instance, if you use uh, concomitant alginates or foams, you can place that right underneath the, the uh, appliance itself. And then you can go ahead and just apply your compression therapy on top. So it really doesn't change any of the modalities that you might be uh, administering to help expedite the wound healing. Okay. And from the I think it, yeah, sorry, I think uh, they mentioned yeah. that you can use up to four layers of compression uh, from a company standpoint, in addition to that. So sorry, David, go ahead. That's all right. No, that's all right. It's like princess in the pea with the compression. It's like how many mattresses can you use? You can use up to four here. <laughs> before uh, the, you can't go up to like 16 uh, but uh, that would be uh but but no i, I think a four layer wrap is is like yeah the standard and uh, but um as regards other i think what's helpful to understand here is that this is kind of like something of a I, i'm excited about the future because uh you know i think the form factors here for these technologies are uh you know they could probably build on them and and it's almost creating like um one of my old friends, um, Elof Erickson, who's a plastic surgeon, uh, just retired from the Brigham, but he used to he created like a wound chamber years ago where he wanted to try to, you know, put different things into it and kind of get feedback from it in terms of, a, uh, you know, sort of a, um, a kind of a, a closed loop kind of system. This to me reminds me of that, where you have almost a, a, a closed an environment where you can actually start, um, you know, you can optimize uh, your wound environment, you can offload really well, which we do, you know, uh, with this, uh, if, if it's on the, even if it's on the bottom of the foot. And I think, um, you know, there's going to be further iterations here. They're going to really make this, you know, better and better. And for me, it, it's exciting. It's exciting to see these data emerge. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, for this and other technologies. So to, to complete question to you. So, so has it changed your like, have you been using it more often instead of other adjunctive treatments for your diabetic foot ulcers? Or is it still kind of the same? So I, I, so the way I use it is like everyone else on here. I'm trying my best to use it within the confines of, of reimbursement in my um, institution um, as well. So we can use it. I use it, we use it a lot now as part of our clinical trial program, uh, okay. which is awesome because uh, uh, there are members of our um uh, wound healing unit that are kind of evangelical about this, right? Because they, and uh, especially with the pain relief and the tissue and the tissue repair and wound healing uh, capacity. And I think as this becomes more and more widely available um, to uh, a broader segment of patients, we're going to be able to use it even beyond that. And for some of our, you know, and obviously also you see for veterans, if you're in the VA and you have AIDS at the VA and you can treat people, you have that option as well. Great. Um, one question I had for you, which I was actually surprised, Dr. Orpala, when you said this was like for me, and I'm not an eight hyperbaric oxygen expert user or anything like that, but you know, you, you almost made it sound like HBO would still be your kind of primary treatment for a lot of these patients. And you did say there were certain indications and then based on your 
you know, the classification of Wagner three and four, that would still be. Uh, for me, I was always thinking that this would, so that would be my first line would be CDO. And then if that didn't work, I would go to HBO. So can you comment on that? I mean, you, you have much more experience with all these, you know, wounds that use HBO than I do. So it, my, it was interesting to hear you say that, so. Well, I don't think the cat's out of the bag yet. You know, things definitely might change. Uh, I think that we just have to think about CDO therapy in the back of our heads before we jump to HBO therapy. And those patients that may uh, not be suitable for HBO therapy are certainly, you know, possible candidates for CDO therapy. And I think there's a broader indication for CDO therapy than HBO therapy. So we have used CDO therapy uh, much more than HBO therapy because right. of the broader indications. So I think that, uh, you know, there's definitely a wide array of application for CDO therapy. And I wouldn't say that I always uh, jump to HBO therapy first, but we do have that available. So if you certainly don't have that available, then I would definitely strongly consider CDO therapy. But if you, you obviously, um, based on the trials, randomized control trials, you know, obviously certain grades of uh, applications of um, hyperbaric therapy would be applicable, you know, in certain types of patients, uh, especially with deeper wounds and that involve the bone. So, or gangrene. And those patients you wouldn't necessarily use CDO therapy for, especially with gangrene because of the perfusion. So, um, so I don't, I don't see that there's, uh, there's a conflict. I actually see it working together to help heal the, the wounds faster. So out of that small subset of patients that you presented on the 29 patients, I think. Right. And those are like more COVID related, right? They, so that they couldn't, didn't have to go. So out of those, and you may have kind of reported on it, out of those 29, how many of those would, if they were willing to go or weren't afraid of COVID or whatever, would have gone to H, or you would have thought needed HBO therapy. And you were pleasantly surprised that actually CDO did the trick. Did you have anybody like that? You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, I would say uh, more than half of them Okay. Probably would have, uh, you know, made the indications for hyperbaric oxygen therapy, and then it's hard to say whether the patient would really come in. You know, there's a lot of patients that don't come in for all the restrictions of HBO right. therapy, right. Yeah. so it's hard to say. But perhaps maybe about even half of that might have come in. So you're looking at, you know, but I was surprised, and that's why I'm yeah. here talking about it because <laughs> I was surprised right. Right. that you know uh, these patients. And I think Right. And I think Alicia, I mean, you're actually talking to, you know, Animesh is in San Antonio, which is kind of the birthplace of uh, the kind of the, the modern use of hyperbaric, uh, you know, in not only in divers, but in burns at, you know, at, uh, at Fort Sam and then at, uh, and then of course at the Methodist and then at UT Health Science Center. So, uh, but uh, this is a little like uh, bringing coal to Newcastle, but, but the thing about it is that, you know, this is sort of different from HBO therapy, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's fundamentally a different uh, mechanism of action. I made the joke about, you know, gills and things on the leg. Cause I mean, it's just not, you know, you're not respiring this and it's not super saturating your plasma. Um, so these are really, uh, th these are really not mutually exclusive either, right? It, it you know, you, you wouldn't like, um, you know, take someone off, uh, oxygen at home because they were on oxygen, you know, at, or some other kind of, uh, uh, you know, be, 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 uh, so, so these are, it's like two different delivery systems. It's, uh, um, and I, I think maybe the two could be used together or maybe, you know, no HBOT uh, uh, in some cases and, uh, and vice versa. I, don't you think? I think Dave, you hit the nail on his head. You know, that's really, they're totally different devices, different mechanisms that we talked about. And I think that they could be used either probably together or, you know, depending upon um, what's needed for the patient. And, and I think the problem, um, at least for me personally, and, and why I was so very skeptical about this up until just the last few years when these data have been emerging, has been that, um, you know, the, the, these things, you know, they, they, it looks uh, goofy, right? I mean, you have like uh, oxygen going into something on an extremity. Um, you know, on a, on a wound and you're saying, 
okay, where exactly is this, was the respiration happening, right? And, uh, and uh, um, but in fact, there is a real physiologic effect and, and that, that is, the data are there for that. And, and now you have all of these randomized control trials and, and uh, uh, meta-analyses uh, slash systematic reviews around this too. Frankly, more than for, remarkably more than for systemic hyperbaric or I should say it, uh, although I think they're just the two are different categories. And then last question, I know to be mindful of everybody's time. So those that you, do you, do you use it in conjunction with other wound care products? Uh, you know, there's lots of things you can put into the wound to help debris it or whatever. Have you been using it in combination or by itself or where does that come in for you guys? I've been using it for both. You know, in some cases, uh, uh, some wounds that are a little bit more exudated, I might put something underneath it. Uh, and in other cases, I would place it, uh, it as a direct application. David? Yeah. And I, you know, we wouldn't think of like, if we were treating like cardio, you know, someone's cardiovascular health, we wouldn't think of like using a, of, of not using a statin because we're using a, a loop diuretic, right? I mean, um, so, I, I mean, I think that we have to get more sophisticated in how we're assessing these things. And this is a whole different discussion though, Adam, it's, it's really about how we have to have companion diagnostics to tell us when to start this and stop this. For instance, if we were giving someone a statin, we'd use, we'd test their cholesterol. If we were giving someone uh, a, a hydrochlorothiazide or a diuretic, we'd, we'd check their blood pressure, but we, do, we don't have those readily available now in tissue repair and wound healing. That's changing, which is awesome. But I think that the, the, the ability to use this with other things is there. I mean, the form factor is there. We've used it with a bunch of different uh, tissue products, uh, both synthetic and, um, um, and uh, you know, like, uh, uh, and, and, and um, allergenic and even skin grafts and other kinds of things, you know, regularly. So I don't see, I don't see this as being if um, and, and or. And by the way, I think there are a lot of people that are, that, uh, you know, we tried this on um, skin graft donor sites for the pain because, um, you know, skin graft donor site is going to heal no matter what you do, frankly. Um, and we, we use it on the skin graft donor site uh, just for the pain. And that's actually kind of helpful as an analgesic. So anyway, I, I'm sorry for sucking all the oxygen out of this discussion. <laughs> um, <laughs> to speak. My, my point was that it's good to think of it as, as mutually, it's not mutually exclusive to other treatments. So yes, that's so, it, baby. So, you know, I think that's the important thing. Um, last thing is um, someone asked about certain pressure and the device. You can change the flow rate as to how much oxygen. So just real quickly, is there a minimum pressure or a delivery rate you use? Either of you, I knew you mentioned eight mils. Uh, yes. And so yeah. I think most are using eight to 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll leave it at that because um, I know we're over time. So uh, overall, you can go three to 15. Uh, per hour. And again, that'll have effects on exudate and everything else. So I'll leave it at that. Um, it's where I'm being told this is our end. So again, both of you, thank you for joining us tonight. All we had a great showing almost 130 something participants. So, so uh, a lot of people from all over. Again, if you need to use it now move to Nova Scotia, because we had a lot of people uh, apparently chime in saying they can get it readily and have been using it, which is great. Or maybe if you're a Newfie, maybe you can go to like Newfoundland as well. So that's another possibility. All you Canadians. <laughs> but I want to thank everybody for uh, participating. I want to thank EO2 and our friends there for supporting this activity.